Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, I just want to start by saying that uh, neither Manoj nor I are experts on uh, technology. Uh, if anything, uh, my greatest achievement is being able to run my computer. So uh, that speaks to a lot of my, uh, it, you know, my ability to navigate technology. But what we uh, have thought about and things uh, that we have considered about and uh, questions that we will be engaging with today uh, is thinking about the question of uh, caste within the context of data and privacy. So the sort of expanse of our discussion today uh, will speak to how caste is and has always been uh, the sort of building blocks for data uh, in India. Uh, we want to then very briefly uh, speak about uh, how this has acquired uh, a sort of digital form uh, and we also want to in doing so reflect on the politics of uh, creating data, data collection uh, and the various ways in which uh, data has been uh, both used to challenge and entrench uh, caste-based hierarchies. Uh, my work, of course, is on questions of policing. Uh, I don't see policing and caste as being uh, two separate entities. So it's work on caste policing uh, and not caste and policing as a lot of people like to refer to it. And uh, so I will reflect on uh, how data and data building is a crucial part of uh, the creation, entrenchment, and replication of caste policing in India. And Manoj is here, of course, uh, recently published much acclaimed book on uh, caste and law, uh, an area of uh, study and inquiry uh, that most lawyers are yet to apply their mind to. So very excited to be in conversation, Manoj. Thank you. I am also very excited to interact with somebody who is so deeply involved in policing. And uh, this is all the more because uh, my research and writing on the subject taught me how uh, when it comes to caste, uh, it's not just about police. Uh, practically every section of uh, society is uh, deeply uncomfortable talking about it. We, un we recognize, uh, not all of us, uh, I mean the more discerning, the more honest ones recognize the reality of caste, but as for most people, I mean th there is this a illusion that uh, this is something we've got over it. We have uh, we are in a state of denial. So I, uh, one of the aspects that I got to research was, uh, you know, the intersection of uh, law and race in U.S. and uh, uh, the intersection of uh, law and caste in India. The thing, one of the things that struck me was that um, there's far greater acknowledgement of uh, that uh, reality of uh, the persistence of race in the US than is the case uh, in India of the corresponding persistence of caste. Uh, this shows in many ways. And um, let me, uh, you know, at this point mention that uh, right now, as a journalist, it is very natural for me to think of uh, what's on top of people's minds, which we call news peg. News peg for this uh, debate is uh, uh, the ongoing litigation, first in the uh, Patna High Court, not too long ago, early this month, there was a judgment, uh, which uh, many saw as a very progressive judgment. And then there's a challenge to that in the Supreme Court from an organization called Youth for Equality. The judgment of the Patna High Court was uh, uh, a green signal to the uh, Bihar government's uh, uh, proposal of uh, carrying out a caste census. You may recall that uh, about a decade ago, in 2011, this was attempted for the first time, or rather it was revived after a lapse of uh, many decades. The last uh, caste census was done way back in 1931. And then uh, there was uh, anyway an interruption because of the World War. There was no 41 census clearly. And then 51 onwards after we um, became a republic, it was decided that because uh, we had uh, reservations, affirmative action essentially for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes at the national level, we will be collecting data only on those two uh, communities. Uh, 
so there was a decision that there will be no need to take, uh, uh, you know, uh, do a cast, uh, uh, to get a sense of caste demographics across the board, right? But then post-90, after this Mandal decision was made, when reservations for uh, SEBCs or OBCs as they are called, who are essentially Shudra, part of the Shudra community, which, Shudra Varna. As you all know, there are four Varnas. Uh, Shudra is the fourth Varna. It doesn't mean they are one-fourth. The top three Varnas, the elite Varnas, the, the twice-born Varnas, they are actually very few in number. It's the, the dominant section of uh, India's population is really Shudras. And in that Shudra Varna, the lower segment is the OBCs. The upper segment are, the, are, the, are what are called intermediate castes, um, right? So now, uh, the, when it, the decision was made to extend uh, affirmative action to OBCs, at the national level and then subsequently at, uh, in various states, uh, especially in the north, it was for the first time. Uh, the need for uh, accurate uh, data on this was felt. You know, just as there was some uh, information, some data available for SCs and STs, there should be something for OBCs also because after all, uh, so much uh, of resources has been, is being devoted to them. We need to have a sense of what are the achievements, what are the failings, is it working, or how it can be fine-tuned, and so on and so forth. But far from uh, recognizing that logic, what was uh, being um, uh, said again and again by uh, people in the current dispensation, especially, because the decision to revive uh, the, the uh, caste uh, census was taken by the previous government, Manmohan Singh government. But then, before they got around to announcing the data, because there were some issues about, I mean, those, apparently there were errors and so on. Before they could sort out those things, there was a change of government. Now, this government is very clear in its head that uh, there will be no such data uh, put, uh, put out. And as it happened, the 2021 census anyway could not take place this time because of COVID. And as far as the 2011 data is concerned, no, we don't want to put it out because it's going to be divisive. I mean, some might find it ironic that this government finds caste uh, uh, demographics uh, information divisive and not uh, much of what they are themselves doing. So that prompted some of the other parties, most importantly Congress, to take the position that, okay, we have a few states uh, where we are ruling, so Karnataka and elsewhere, so we will try and um, uh, do some census there. Uh, uh, Stalin, in, uh, uh, the chief minister of Tamil Nadu, said he would do it. And, and um, Nik uh, Nitish Kumar uh, beat them all uh, by coming out with this uh, proposal last year, and it was being rolled out this year when it became a subject of litigation. Now, the w important thing is, sorry, should I, should I complete no, the point? Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. You know, there was something very interesting that happened when the matter came before the Supreme Court, after the, high, after the Patna High Court uh, gave its uh, green signal. Uh, this, um, the, you know, the written submissions that uh, this um, Youth for Equality made before the Supreme Court says that the Mandal judgment, the one that uh, led to the, uh, you know, that uh, gave the green signal to the 1990 uh, decision of the VP Singh government of introducing uh, reservations for OBCs. Now, the Mandal judgment needs reconsideration, uh, is what uh, this uh, Youth for Equality says, uh, to the extent it holds that affirmative action can be based on caste. Now, I find, found that uh, very significant because I mean, it goes on to say, no person can be attributed a religion or caste as a birthmark. The individual's choice of um, faith, belief, and nature of work cannot be taken away by the circumstances of birth. The fixing of caste by birth is perpetuation of jati and is antithetical to varna. Now, the distinction they are making between jati and varna is actually a trope that is that goes back two centuries. You know, I when I did this uh, book, which was referred to just now, caste pride, battles for equality in Hindu India. The battles I'm referring to are battles that were fought in the legal sphere. This is about uh, the intersection of law and caste. So these are all battles that were fought in legislatures and courts, right? So. And these are not battles between, say, upper caste and lower caste. The, when I say it's in Hindu India, what I meant was that this was, these were battles essentially between two sets of Hindus, liberal, progressive Hindus, 
and conservative obscurantist Hindus. Now, the latter's position was consistently, you know, that in the early decades of, uh, in, the, in the 19th century and early decades of uh, the 20th century, during the colonial period, was that, uh, look, this is all, they were very unabashed in uh, claiming that Varna system was all about uh, birth, where it's all about, it's all birth based. And uh, on the other side, uh, you know, those who tried to give a liberal uh, interpretation to our scriptures, uh, tried to uh, make it uh, closer to the conception of class, where there is some mobility. But then the problem was, both were engaging in some wishful thinking when they would uh, say in the subsequent decades that our uh, uh, scriptures were not really so rigid, that they were not so unfair to lower caste. Because off late, uh, the ones who represented the Hindu right during the colonial period have been taking a diff have been singing a different tune. They often say in uh, Bhagavad Gita there is this quote, there is this sloka which says that um, you know caste is uh, that where it's, Krishna is quoted as saying that I created varna system on the basis of guna and karma. Now this was interpreted to mean that if you display a certain guna and karma you could on that basis belong to whichever caste that is applicable to you. But in reality, there is no such uh, mechanism, there's no such process, there is no such uh, precedent either. No, I'm uh, interrupting you here, Manoj, yeah. because I also think it's important to say is how this idea of guna, karma, then translates itself to law making of a certain kind through the Manusmriti, right? Uh, which is speaking to, you know, what is con considered to be the code of conduct uh, for people who are based, you know, depending on where you are located within the caste system. And at the same time, if you were to not toe the line, then what is the kind of punishment that should be uh, meted out to you for not adhering to the prescribed caste boundaries? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one glaring example of uh, there being absolutely no basis to this guna karma uh, face saver that uh, you know the Hindu right has come up with in recent uh, years is uh, say the great uh, Shivaji you know right from medieval period uh, we don't know how it was uh, prior to that but we have this historically recorded example of Shiva uh, Shivaji who by any reckoning uh, ticked all the boxes of being a great uh, Kshatriya he was acclaimed as uh, an all-time great warrior. He was also seen as a visionary administrator. And yet, the Brahmins of his kingdom refused to anoint him as Chhatrapati, uh, a, a, po a post that he wanted, you know, after escaping from the clutches of Aurangzeb in uh, uh, Agra. When he returned to his kingdom, for strategic reasons, he said, now I should be in a, in a uh, position to deal on equal terms with the uh, Mughal emperor. I want to be anointed as Chhatrapati, but uh, Brahmins of his uh, kingdom refused. So he had to get somebody all the way from Benares to somehow circumvent that. The reason that the Brahmins of his kingdom refused was a very fancy theory that whatever the scriptures may say about the four Varnas, you know, that are there, the Chatur Varna, in Kali Yuga, there are only two Varnas. This is the claim that Brahmins made right from Shivaji's days onwards. They said that there are only Brahmins, that is, I mean, the elite, who are, are imbued with qualities of sattva, and then there are these shudras, the servile community, who are steeped in tamas. So there was, in India, according to them, their own narrative, there was nobody really with rajas, the, the martial qualities, the qualities that were required to protect Manoj, India and yeah. all that, right? So this is a kind of, you know, uh, self-defeating uh, uh, claim that they made. And this came to light in the 19th century when these debates that I was referring to in courts, you know, there was actually a case which went all the way to Privy Council. Sorry, yeah. let me complete this point. Yeah. Because it's a very interesting example. It's very revealing. Um, those who are... Uh, those who want details, you will find them in this book. Now, that Privy Council judgment, it was on a case that came from uh, Bihar, had to go into this question where these people, Rajputs, who were reduced to 
appearing before these white judges in London, uh, asking them, look, you please tell us, do we still exist or not? Do we Kshatriya still exist in this Kali Yuga, in this modern age or not? Why are we asking this? Because Brahmins are saying that there are only Brahmins and Shudras, because it was very self-serving. It meant that the rest of the Hindu society was all you know, way down in the hierarchy. They were all impure, and these guys were the only pure ones. And they were very assertive about their own heritage and said, we, are, we still exist. So it was, it was that Privy Council which had to give that ruling in 1850s. And then on the other uh, twice-born uh, Varna, that is Vaishyas, the Banya community, the business community, they too had to go get a ruling. And this was from Bombay High Court. It was from none other than uh, Justice Ranade, who is otherwise a social reformer. Manoj, I'm going to have to come in here because I think they're Sorry. waiting with bated breath for us to come to data. Yeah. So we will yeah. put them out of their and sense of anticipation. No, but when you say about the caste census, and uh, I want to pick up on that because, of course, uh, you know, Youth for Equality, ironically, uh, you know, an ironically named body, one of the things that they argued in the Supreme Court uh, is that, you know, having a or having caste census or an exercise of this kind. Uh, has the potential to make caste, which is a very private kind of exercise, a public matter, right? Uh, you know, thrusting it into the public domain, uh, to which the bench responded and said that, you know, everybody knows each other's caste, people also know their uh, neighbor's caste, so what, what are you saying? You know, so, and, I, and I want to, and also drawing from something uh, that you said, right, about caste as a birthmark. I want to build on that idea uh, in terms of how the police has been able to do this through data collection, right? Police and policing. Uh, and a sort of really glaring example of, you know, caste as being a birthmark uh, and the sort of encoding of that through data has happened uh, through the Criminal Tribes Act. Uh, but before I want, I come to that, I want to speak a little bit about how data collection has always been. And, and when I say data collection, I don't mean just, you know, data as an abstract entity, but caste as data, right? So understanding of caste, entrenching of caste, building on one's understanding of caste has been very, very crucial. Through data has been very crucial, a crucial part of the policing project. Uh, because, you know, so much of, and there is this fantastic work for those who haven't read, uh, Radha Kumar's book uh, called Police Matters. Uh, she speaks to very, very eloquently about uh, the kind of data collection that the police was doing in the early colonial period, uh, where data is, you know, police data becomes the sort of crux of understanding governmentality, right? So, you know, how districts are to be reshaped, uh, how many police stations will be where, all of this is on the basis of the kind of data that the police is generating. And the police is also, you know, it's an incredibly smart institution. I think we've been really unfair to them. Uh, because they they have always been very good with knowing where their priorities lie. You know, so in 1902 when the police commission was set up, although, you know, the police as an agency, as a body, was always been, you know, as they would say, understaffed, right? So the number of people you are policing, the population that you are policing, and the number of police personnel, that ratio has been quite skewed. But what the 1902 Police Commission report did and said is that we must cut down on police beats, you know, so this daily patrolling, because what we are interested in doing and which is central to the project of policing is that we want to create spaces and people who need to be policed. And it's the creation of those object of policing which has happened through data and which has happened through this data which is located in caste, right? And to build on this further, I want to speak to, you know, this sort of colonial invention because again, you know, one of the things that we really like doing particularly as lawyers is to say that the starting point of everything is coloniality, right? So everything was great and then the British came in and then destroyed our perfectly lovely world. But the British came in and not particularly innovative chaps, right? So they were doing, you know, in other British colonies, their habitual offenders, you know, criminal classes, all of it. So they come here and they say, we need to replicate this year. And they didn't have to put in too much effort because the caste system was there, right? So they started by saying, you know, we want to 
there is a category of people, you know, they say this is the first colonial invention of crime, which is the creation of the category of a thuggy. And they said a thuggy, it began with a really specific definition to say is a person, is a robber who strangulates their victims with a silk scarf. So very specific. And then central to this project of saying we need a thuggy is the setting up of what are called thuggy and dakati departments. So what do thuggy and dakati departments do? They collect data on people who are who they see as thugs, right? And a useful and a very important part of this characterization are people who are wandering. Because the idea is that people who are constantly on the move are very hard to watch, are very hard to discipline. And these also happen to be people who don't fall within the fourfold caste hierarchy, right? So the ones that you would call as being Avarna, uh, or, you know, we would refer to as tribes, so nomadic, semi-nomadic in nature, to say these are the people that we need to watch and what is the kind of information that they collect, right? So they're collecting intelligence on names, characters, manners of speech, signs that thugs use to identify each other. All of these things is information that they're collecting. But what is very interesting to note here is that you're only collecting information on a certain kind of people, right? So while it, you, the perpetrated project is to say we want to find data on criminality, it is already this existing idea of criminality which is informing the collection of data. So it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're already seeing a certain kind of people as being criminals and being worthy of being policed, right? And then this category doesn't work out very well for them because it keeps growing and growing until one day, you know, some thuggy department decides to declare Brahmins as thugs, right? Which is obviously a terrible idea. We can never say out aloud that Brahmins are thugs. It's an open secret that we must all live with. But so they say Brahmins are thugs, which is when they're done for. And they said, now we have to shut down this enterprise. And so now the thuggy department falls apart and it gives rise to the old definition of criminals by birth when you go back to the good old wandering people. And that is what has given rise to what we understand as policing in the modern sense, right? Because the Criminal Tribes Act allows for the crux of it is you know, you are a criminal by birth and it's, it's not just individuals. I want to stress on this and we will, you know, discuss this as we go along is the idea of a family being a criminal, right? So it's people are put into settlements and a crucial part of this exercise is the maintenance of criminal tribes registers, which has some really granular information on you know, who you are, who your friends are, what do these people look like, tracking their movements, you know, taking roll calls, multiple times taking roll calls, all of this information which then becomes a part of this register. We, we continue to know this now, you know, obviously popular culture has popularized, you, you know, these kind, this kind of language, history sheet, rowdy sheet, gunda registers. So terms like history sheeter, rowdy sheeter, gunda sheeter, the next time, you know, we use them to describe somebody who we don't think fits, you know, in line with what social norms are. We need to remember what is the origin story of this, right? And Radha Kumar also says how in Tamil Nadu there are registers like the Marava register which is a caste. So a criminal tribe register comes to be called the Marava register. Now it also speaks to the spectacle of surveillance, right? Because this is data that is purportedly being generated to surveillance, for surveillance. But this is data which is also made public. So everybody knows there is a Marava register, it's made public, everybody knows who's on that register, everybody knows who a criminal tribe is, and everybody knows, because it's, it's, it's also very spatially demarcated, right? So it's also, and I mean, in the earlier conversation, the one that Shivangi was on, she was speaking about criminal hotspots, right? Crime hotspots. Think of it as your OG crime hotspot, where you're seeing that, you know, these are spaces that are, we are going to confine certain communities to certain spaces. And then because those communities are inhabiting those spaces, those spaces by default become unsafe spaces. So how the idea of, you know, coalescing existing as a person belonging to an oppressed caste community then becomes synonymous with being unsafe and therefore the category of crime, right? So I feel like it's really important 
to look at and see this history of data collection because I also want to push back against this idea which is very, very often floated and particularly in the last, you know, over a decade or so, which is that, you know, this, you know, data contributes to bias. Data contributes to bias. I'm really sick of this because the data has always been biased. The data is cast. You know, it is not pushing for a bias. It was meant to be an encoding of that and evidence of that. So it's really important for us to bear that in mind when we're saying the data is biased because it, it allows us to and allows for some people then to come and say, oh, let's think about what would a reformed caste system look like, right? What would it look like? It would still be violent, you know? Nikita, may I come in here? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, something about uh, this data collection. What I uh, can't uh, resist saying at this point is uh, uh, this instance of how uh, India collect started collecting data on uh, Dalits. Uh, they were called depressed classes then. Yeah. For the first time, as a result of a uh, resolution that was proposed in uh, Parliament, or what was then called uh, Imperial Legislative Council in 1916. Uh, you know, for many years, there was such, as I said earlier, there's such hypocrisy about caste. It's a reality, but we pretend that we are all, we've all transcended it, we know nothing about it, right? Now, this is not a modern phenomenon. It was there earlier too. And as it, I mean, this began with, say, the very founding of uh, Indian National Congress. As you all know, Congress was founded in 1885. In 1886, the then um, uh, president of Congress, uh, uh, Dadabhai Naroji, laid down a policy for Congress saying that uh, there will be no uh, discussion on caste. There will be no resolutions relating to caste before Congress. We will focus only on political issues, nothing on social issues. So, and for, uh, therefore, for many decades, there was no discussion on it. As a result of that, Congress members who were part of the legislature never uh, broached this subject at all. It was left to an unknown Parsi legislator who was not from the Congress called uh, Manakji Dada Boy, again another Dada Boy, whose role was just the reverse of what the earlier Dada Boy said. He was the one who proposed it. And there was vehement opposition to it from co prominent Congress leaders who were the Hindu right of the time. The, uh, you know, um, Madan Mohan Malviya, Surindranath Banerjee, who were at different times presidents of Congress party. They oppose any discussion on it, saying that you are offending our religious feelings. Let's not have any discussion on untouchability. This is not a subject that should be discussed at all uh, by before the legislature. But the colonial administration said, okay, since there is such vehement opposition to it, we they persuaded uh, Dada, uh, Manakji Dadabhai to withdraw the uh, resolution, but promised to act on it, uh, the substance of it. As a result, they began to then start collecting data for the first time. They sent out a circular to all the states, you know, please collect data on these depressed classes to understand what kind of disabilities they face, what kind of measures, special measures can be taken to ameliorate their lot. So all that began after this discussion. And in uh, 1919, Madras for the first time set up what is known as protector of uh, depressed classes, which was the you know, the earliest prototype of what we see today as, uh, say, Ministry of Social Empowerment or Commission for Scheduled Cars and so on. That was the earliest body. So that is when we began to collect data. But then you see how at that time in 1916, there was such unease, such discomfort, uh, betrayed by uh, caste Hindus to the collection of data on uh, uh, Dalits. And here in 2023, we see similar uh, uh, discomfort being displayed by caste Hindus to collection of data on OBCs, the lower uh, Shudras, uh, again in relation to ameliorating their lot, you know, to see how the affirmative action is working. But you, you come up with all sorts of reasons. Manu, One reason I, is I think you can't force caste entity on us as if we don't have caste as a reality. It is because of this uh, affirmative action yeah. that you have made us conscious of caste. No, I think what the caste, I think the OBC, of course, getting data on OBCs would shift a lot of things around because it's a category that is perhaps one of the most heterogeneous categories, right? So Dalit Muslims, Dalit Christians, tribes, everybody that they couldn't category. put any, anywhere are there. But I think the anxiety about having this data is twofold. One is that it mit I think it really bursts the bubble of certain groups who have 
for a very long time historically masqueraded as the general category aka the casteless category so it allows us to name and assign caste to those who have always spoken about caste only in terms of dalits adivasis or shudras and secondly it also speaks to how that castelessness or the existence of being an upper caste slash casteless body has allowed them to amass resources and opportunities disproportionate to their numbers within the overall population and it gives and there's a danger of uh, it giving a lot of political traction to yeah. a very loaded term that is bahujan bahujan yeah yeah, yeah. And that then, we are the much and yeah. the solidarity of uh, dalits and bahujans yeah. so all those kind of uh, you and know solidarity is uh, being built pressure from yeah. uh, below coming yeah. up and uh, you know blowing up this narrative you yeah. know, all those things are i think it really are, turns uh, this idea of you know what we've been saying this is majoritarian rule majoritarian rule it actually turns that narrative on its head to say that it's actually the rule of the minority yeah the, you know the it's the rule the of top. a really handful of minority who are calling the shots in multiple ways and then what it does is it bursts your bubble in terms of this category of the hindu because you realize that it's actually just a conglomeration of castes yeah. you know and then i think it's that make believe category and not pushing for that make believe category to be dispelled uh, is and doing you know safeguarding that is what uh, the entire project is about because otherwise data collection is their favorite job uh, i mean you know hyderabad and there's a lot of work that has happened on hyderabad and shrinivas is here so he can speak to this but one of the signaling to us to yeah we'll take a minute because there was a break so uh, uh the idea i mean when telangana became an independent state one of the first surveys that they did was the comprehensive family survey right it's very important to pay attention to you know it was supposed to be a civic survey on 94 parameters but conducting a survey like that you know mapping people's family trees also tell you who tells you who is placed where in the caste hierarchy right and then that data then becomes the basis of all programs you know policing social welfare all of it so it's a it's it's that sort of marking of bodies uh, that has been an exercise that i mean you you are not going to call it the caste census but you are still doing that and you are using that data to do precisely what the caste census would have done yeah so should we i think we should close and open for q and a yeah so we'll just take one question and i see one hand already up before i stood up so um shaila okay we'll take both together a request please keep it as brief as possible and only questions any insights please do share with the speakers after the event right um uh, thank you for the session it was really take great i'm janvi my question is from like a sociological point of view um it is when you talk about the intermingling of the words bahujan and dalit and adivasi and now solidarity has turned into an in intersectional talk of in, uh, of um allyship so to say um within that what would be your comment on jab uh, in your inter uh, personal spaces you use the vocabulary of that to be subliminally casteist or to be subliminally um non progressive but now you have gained progressive ontology which also just one second uh go down to a policy framework in terms of how the EWS uh reservation came into play and how it was talked about and how it was looked at so do you have comments about that uh we'll quickly take uh, the question at the back and that's it sorry we've run over time uh thank you nikita for bringing telangana uh i think when you look at caste and data and census right i mean recent with SECC and the Bihar census uh, going to courts, right? When we talk about the upcoming census, so we know Telangana census was kind of new, but if you look at it critically, it's the end of census, right? Like you're through linking Ada from your birth and death, you don't want to do 10 year census anymore. You want to track every individual from their birth to death. Yeah. We are being marked, stamped, uh demarcated a uh, body subbing track now what is it that you would think of a future of end of census i mean 
when you're talking about colonial procedures and the historical aspects of caste and census, yeah. it's been completely replaced. Yeah. I, and I, I can't think of it. I, I have to accept it. I don't understand it enough yeah. to imagine a world where you're ending census. Yeah. The census of 2024 is going to be the end. Yeah. Right? Now, what would caste and how, uh, what sort of location, the, when you talk about census, again, you're also demarcating boundaries. This is again coming back to delimitation yeah. of 26. Yeah. So your thoughts on this would be great. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. Anyone? I'm not sure if I understood your question. Broadly, I, the sense I get is that um, it uh, makes us conscious of something uh, that we, uh, in the interest of citizenship, modernity, should not be thinking so much about, should not be so conscious about. Is that what you mean? Okay, okay. Uh, let me uh, tell you at this point, I'm not a, a pundit, I'm a storyteller. So I have a story that comes to my mind is that when uh, we abolished uh, untouchability, even at that time, the discussion was, look, untouchability, there were some people in the Constituent Assembly who pointed out that untouchability is actually a symptom. Uh, the disease is caste. So why are we not attempting to abolish caste? So the answer to that, there was even a committee that was set up, uh, Divakar committee, RR Divakar committee, to explore this question. And what the conclusion they came to was that, look, uh, how do we uh, ameliorate the lot of uh, the ones who have been victims of caste system unless we recognize them as those who belong to that low uh, position in that hierarchy. Uh, so there is no getting away from it. So this is a reality that uh, we have to bear you know, even if uh, ideally we would not want to think. And those who are in denial over caste, as is commonly said, it's a bit of a cliche, that you are actually betraying your own privileged position, you know. So for uh, those who are at the receiving end of caste, they have no option but to, you know, be dealing with uh, the mal effects of it and uh, uh, constantly grappling with that uh, issue, that beast. So it's a very difficult situation to be in. Uh, there is something similar going on in the U.S. too. There is no pat reply to that, but that's the way it is. That's the best I can yeah, say. I'm, you can answer the second. Yeah. Srinivas, if I understand your question correctly, your question is about, you know, what happens with the end of the census, right? And how, so I, I think that, and of course, with Hyderabad... I what is this end of census? Uh, I think your question is that after 2024, 20, there will be no further... Is that what you are saying? That the that's the last time that I mean they have they haven't done the census for over a decade you're, now anyway. You're profiling individuals. Yeah. From their birth, you yeah. don't need a census anymore. Okay, you are saying it's become a redundant exercise. They yeah. won't do it either. The yeah. plan has always been this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They have been so, very clear. No, but I think that's the idea, yeah. right? Like, I think the census was perhaps the only form of data collection, which one can say is. A data collection that is drawing attention to or spelling out structures of power, right? Every other form of data collection is derived from and used to entrench that same system. And I think what they've been able to do that as a ruse and particularly with technology and just in Hyderabad, the kind of madness that is there with, you know, you're constantly collecting data of different kinds. You're also now merging data, so it's a great mix and match with things like the mission Chabutra, uh, where you know you're saying wandering youths, you know people who are sitting in their mohalla, you're picking them up, you're taking their fingerprints. So it's it's already that collection of data, using that data to create disciplined bodies, you know, disciplined bodies who will tow the line. That was always the plan, right? Is you don't need to actually now, you know the era of the policeman hitting people with a lathi is gone. The lathi has been replaced with tabs. You know, in Hyderabad, everybody says our, the Telangana police walks, out, walks around with tabs. So I think that kind of meaning making with making data and data collection omnipresent has then allowed for them to sort of make this case to say that why is a separate 
data collection exercise required one and secondly what that then does is then that makes and centers like one is entrenches obviously the margins but also you know allow obfuscates the idea of what is it that is pushing for this to happen right like what i was saying earlier that obviously caste is an evolving category and certain people have been casteless and the fact that now we are not there is no record of them in any way then allows for that castelessness to be further naturalized right to say oh you know this particular ex location is a really safe location i feel so good there and that is that is that area is a problem or you know if you see a certain kind of person then you say ki मतलब दिस दिस पर्सन इज अ रिकॉर्ड ना यू कैन वेरी क्लियरली से देखो आप उसका फिंगरप्रिंट लगाएंगे तो पता चलेगा हंड्रेड परसेंट राउडी शीटर है सो दैट काइंड ऑफ नेविगेशन ऑफ पीपल्स वर्ल्ड एंड वर्ल्ड मेकिंग इज ऑलरेडी हैपनिंग एंड एंड द वे दैट यू नो आई एंड माई कॉलीग्स एट द सी पी ए प्रोजेक्ट सी इट वॉट वी आर सींग इज नाउ द राइज एंड द क्रिएशन ऑफ वॉट वी सी एज द डिजिटल कास्ट पनॉप्टिकॉन राइट इट हैज ऑलवेज बिन दनॉप्टिकन पनॉप्टिकॉन ऑफ कास्ट नाउ इट इज द डिजिटल कास्ट पनॉप्टिकॉन एंड द ओनली सॉर्ट ऑफ एंटी thesis to it uh, is having counter data which is in the form of census and which is why the state has come down on it uh, in order to suppress th the data in the kind of consistent and concerted manner that they have thank you so much thank you for taking such a pertinent yet unexplored issue